Chapter 6, Bail, Rule 114 Meaning, Nature and Purpose of Bailed, Bar 1998 1. Under the rules of court, bail is the security given for the release of a person in custody of the law, furnished by him or a bondsman, to guarantee his appearance before any court as required under certain specified conditions. 2. The term bail under the rules of court distinguishes it from the bondsman who furnishes the security given for the provisional release of the person in custody of the law. 3. The rule clearly specifies that the purpose of bail is to guarantee the appearance of a person before any court when so required. That the accused shall appear before the proper court whenever required by the court or by the rules is also one of the conditions and all kinds of bail. A bail application does not only involve the right of the accused to temporary liberty, but likewise the right of the state to protect the people and the peace of the community from dangerous elements. 4. The right to bail is a constitutional right. It is personal in nature and is therefore, viable. 5. The right to bail springs from the presumption of innocence who courted every accused upon whom should not be inflicted incarceration at the outset since after the trial he maintained that the granting of bail would, among others, be consistent with section 4 of rule 114 of the rules of court which provides when bail is a matter of right. On the other hand, the petitioner claims that there is no provision in this Philippine constitution granting the right to bail to a person who is the subject of an extradition request and arrest warrant. The court agreed with the petitioner and advanced the following reasons. a. The use of the word conviction, in the constitutional provision on bail and section 13 of article 3 of the constitution, as well as section 4 of rule 114 of the rules of court suggests that bail applies only when a person has been arrested and detained for violation of Philippine criminal laws. It does not apply to extradition proceedings, because extradition courts do not render judgments of conviction or acquittal. b. The constitutional right to bail flows from the presumption of innocence in favor of every accused who should not be subjected to the loss of freedom as thereafter he would be entitled to acquittal, unless his guilt be proved beyond reasonable doubt. It follows, ruled the court, that the constitutional provision on bail will not apply to a case like extradition, where the presumption of innocence is not at issue. c. Extradition proceedings are not criminal in nature but sui generis a class in itself. Since it is not a criminal proceeding, it will not call into operation all the rights of an accused under the Bill of Rights and does not involve a determination of guilt or innocence. The court however, did not hold that bail never applies in extradition cases. It instead explained that bail is not a matter of right in extradition cases. However, the judiciary has the constitutional duty to curb grave abuse of discretion and tyranny, as well as the power to promulgate rules to protect and enforce constitutional rights. Furthermore, we believe that the right to due process is broad enough to include the grant of basic fairness to extradites. Indeed. The right to due process extends to the life, liberty or property of every person. It is dynamic and resilient, adaptable to every situation calling for its application. Exception to the no bail rule in extradition proceedings. In establishing an exception to the no bail rule, the court and government of the United States of America versus Pergannon, ratiocinated. Accordingly and to best serve the ends of justice, we believe and so hold that, after a potential extradite has been arrested or placed under the custody of the law, bail may be applied for and granted as an exception, only upon a clear and convincing showing, 1, that, once granted bail, the applicant will not be a flight risk or a danger to the community, and, 2, that there exist special, humanitarian and compelling circumstances including, as a matter of reciprocity, those cited by the highest court and the requesting state when it grants provisional liberty in extradition cases therein. Since this exception has no express or specific statutory basis, and since it is derived essentially from general principles of justice and fairness, the applicant bears the burden of proving the above two-tiered requirement with clarity, precision and emphatic forcefulness. The court realizes that extradition is basically an executive, not a judicial responsibility arising from the presidential power to conduct foreign relations. In its barest concept, 
it partakes of the nature of police assistance amongst states, which is not normally a judicial prerogative. Hence, any intrusion by the courts into the exercise of this power should be characterized by caution, so that the vital international and bilateral interests of our country will not be unreasonably impeded or compromised. In short, while the court is ever protective of the sporting idea of fair play, it also recognizes the limits of its own prerogatives and the need to fulfill international obligations. 6. Since bail is the security for the release of a person under custody of the law, it is evident that it is not intended to cover the civil liability of the accused in the same criminal case. The money deposited as bail may however, be considered not only as bail. It may also be applied to the payment of fines and costs while the excess if any shall be returned to the accused or to whoever made the deposit. 7. The question of granting bail to the accused is but an aspect of the criminal action, preventing him or her from eluding punishment in the event of conviction. The grant of bail or its denial has no impact on the civil liability of the accused that depends on conviction by final judgment. 8. When a person indicted for an offence is arrested, he is deemed placed under the custody of the law. He is placed in actual restraint of liberty in jail so that he may be bound to answer for the commission of the offence. He must be detained in jail during the pendency of the case against him, unless he is authorized by the court to be released on bail or on recognizance. All prisoners whether under preventive detention or serving final sentence cannot practice their profession nor engage in any business or occupation, or hold office, elective or appointive, while in detention. 9. The presumption of innocence is not reason for the detained accused to be allowed to hold office or practice his profession. Such presumption of innocence does not carry with it the full enjoyment of civil and political rights, Trillanes v. Pimentel. Constitutional Basis of the Right to Bail 1. All persons, except those charged with offenses punishable by reclusion perpetual when evidence of guilt is strong, shall, before conviction, be bailable by sufficient sureties, or be released on recognizance as may be provided by law. The right to bail shall not be impaired even when the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus is suspended. Excessive bail shall not be required. 2. The Constitution lays down the following principles on bail. a. All persons shall, before conviction, be bailable. This is the general rule which makes the right to bail a constitutional right. Accepted from this general rule are those who are charged with offenses punishable by reclusion perpetual when evidence of guilt is strong. The person accused of such offense however, shall be entitled to bail when evidence of guilt is not strong. b. The suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus does not impair the right to bail. c. Excessive bail is not to be required. 3. The constitutional provision denying bail to those charged with reclusion perpetual when evidence of guilt is strong finds reiteration in the rules of court. No person charged with a capital offense, or an offense punishable by reclusion perpetua, or life imprisonment shall be admitted to bail when evidence of guilt is strong, regardless of the stage of the criminal prosecution. The provision of the rules apply, for instance, to rape or even coup d'etat cases since both are punishable by reclusion perpetua. No distinction is made as to the political complexion of or the moral turpitude involved in the crime charged. 4. The grant or denial of bail to a person charged with an offence punishable by at least reclusion perpetua is made dependent on whether or not the evidence of guilt is strong. Bar 2002. The court has described this quantum of evidence by employing the terms proof evident, evident proof and presumption great. The first two terms were held to mean clear, strong evidence which leads a well-guarded dispassionate judgment to the conclusion that the offence has been committed as charged that the accused is the guilty agent, and that he will probably be punished capitally if the law is administered. Presumption great exists when the circumstances testified to are such that the inference of guilt naturally to be drawn therefrom is strong, clear, and convincing to an unbiased judgment and excludes all reasonable probability of any other conclusion. Even though there is a reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the accused, if on an examination of the entire record the presumption is great that the accused is guilty of a capital offence, bail should be refused. 
The test is not whether the evidence establishes guilt beyond reasonable doubt but rather whether it shows evident guilt or a great presumption of guilt. As such, the court is ministerially bound to decide which circumstances and factors are present which would show evident guilt or presumption of guilt, People v. Cabral. The word strong does not mean proof beyond reasonable doubt. 5. The rule is very explicit as to when admission to bail is discretionary on the part of the respondent judge. In offenses punishable by reclusion perpetua or death, the accused has no right to bail when the evidence of guilt is strong. Thus, if the accused had been sentenced to reclusion perpetua, the bail should have been cancelled, instead of increasing it as respondent judge did. The act of the judge in increasing the bail bond of the accused instead of cancelling it is not a mere deficiency in prudence, discretion and judgment on the part of the judge but a patent disregard of well-known rules. 6. Where the right to bail exists, it should not be rendered nugatory by requiring a sum that is excessive, otherwise the right to bail becomes meaningless. Thus, in an old case where the amount required as bail could not possibly exceed 5,000 pesos for the information for murder and 25,000 pesos for the other information for frustrated murder and that the Department of Justice itself did recommend the total sum of 40,000 pesos for the two offenses, nothing can be clearer, therefore, that fixing the amount of pe, 195, 200. as the bail that should be posted is clearly violative of the constitutional provision, the Lacomar v. Sinage. Bail in the Military The right to bail invoked has traditionally not been recognized and is not available in the military, as an exception to the general rule embodied in the Bill of Rights. The right to a speedy trial is given more emphasis in the military where the right to bail does not exist. The unique structure of the military should be enough reason to exempt military men from the constitutional coverage of the right to bail. The argument that denial from the military of the right to bail would violate the Equal Protection Clause is not acceptable. This guarantee requires equal treatment only of persons or things similarly situated and does not apply where the subject of the treatment is substantially different from others. The accused officers can complain if they are denied bail and other members of the military are not. But they cannot say they have been discriminated against because they are not allowed the same right that is extended to civilians. Bail and Extradition Proceedings 1. In U.S. v. Perganon, one of the issues presented for resolution was whether or not a person facing extradition is entitled to bail. The respondent maintained that this constitutional provision secures the right to bail of all persons, including those sought to be extradited, the only exception being a person who is charged with an offense punishable with reclusion perpetua, when evidence of guilt is strong. Pergannon case re-examined. Five years after, on April 19, 2007, in Hong Kong v. Solalia, Jr., the court ruled anew on the issue of whether or not bail applies to extradition cases in a petition which assailed the order of the RTC of Manila, Branch 8, granting bail to a person subject of extradition proceedings. The court in Hong Kong v. Solalia, Jr., re-examined its own ruling earlier made in Perganon. While admitting that the ruling in the previous case of U.S. Gov. v. Perganon falls squarely to the private respondent's case, the court in Hong Kong v. Solalia, Jr., viewed the issue in the light of the modern trend in international law placing primacy on the worth of the individual person and the sanctity of human rights. Specifically, the court pointed out such trends, which it claims it cannot ignore. 1. The growing importance of the individual person in public international law who, in the 20th century, has gradually attained global recognition. 2. The higher value now being given to human rights in the international sphere. 3. The corresponding duty of countries to observe these universal human rights in fulfilling their treaty obligations. And, 4. The duty of the court to balance the rights of the individual under our fundamental law, on one hand, and the law on extradition, on the other. The Philippines, added the court, along with the other members of the family of nations is committed to uphold fundamental human rights as well as value the worth and dignity of every person. The country has the responsibility of protecting and promoting the right of every person to liberty and due process, 
ensuring that those detained or arrested can participate in the proceedings before court and to make available to every person under detention such remedies which safeguard their fundamental right to liberty. These remedies include the right to be admitted to bail. In re-examining Pergannon, the court made the following observations. First, that the exercise of the state's power to deprive an individual of his liberty is not necessarily limited to criminal proceedings. Respondents in administrative proceedings, such as deportation and quarantine, have likewise been detained. Second, to limit bail to criminal proceedings would be to close our eyes to our jurisprudential history. Philippine jurisprudence has not limited the exercise of the right to bail to criminal proceedings only. This court has admitted to bail persons who are not involved in criminal proceedings. In fact, bail has been allowed in this jurisdiction to persons in detention during the pendency of administrative proceedings, taking into cognizance the obligation of the Philippines under international conventions to uphold human rights. Noting that bail had in the past been granted in deportation proceedings, the court reasoned that if bail can be granted in deportation cases, it sees no justification why it should not also be allowed in extradition cases. Likewise, considering that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights applies to deportation cases, there is no reason why it cannot be invoked in extradition cases. After all, both are administrative proceedings where the innocence or guilt of the person detained is not an issue. Clearly, explained the High Court, the right of a prospective extraditee to apply for bail in this jurisdiction must be viewed in the light of the various treaty obligations of the Philippines concerning respect for the promotion and protection of human rights. Under these treaties, the presumption lies in favor of human liberty. Thus, the Philippines should see to it that the right to liberty of every individual is not impaired. Bail and Deportation Proceedings 1. Aliens in deportation proceedings, as a rule, have no inherent right to bail, and it has been held that a person arrested or detained cannot be released on bail, unless that right is granted expressly by law. Section 37-9, E, of the Philippine Immigration Act of 1940 provides that any alien under arrest in a deportation proceeding may be released under bond or under such other conditions as may be imposed by the Commissioner of Immigration. Note that this provision confers upon the Commissioner of Immigration the power and discretion to grant bail and deportation proceedings, but does not grant to aliens the right to be released on bail. The use of the word may in said provision indicates that the grant of bail is merely permissive and not mandatory or obligatory on the part of the commissioner. The exercise of the power is wholly discretionary. The determination as to the propriety of allowing an alien, subject to deportation under the Immigration Act, to be released temporarily on bail, as well as the conditions thereof, falls within the exclusive jurisdiction of the commissioner, and not in the courts of justice. The reason for this is that the courts do not administer immigration laws. 2. In the case of in the matter of the petition for habeas corpus of Harvey, et al. versus Defensor Santiago, the denial by the respondent commissioner of immigration of the petitioner's release on bail, was challenged by them. The denial was found to be in order by the court because in deportation proceedings, the right to bail is not a matter of right but a matter of discretion on the part of the Commissioner of Immigration and Deportation. Thus, Section 37E of the Philippine Immigration Act of 1940 provides that any alien under arrest in a deportation proceeding may be released under bond or under such other conditions as may be imposed by the Commissioner of Immigration. The use of the word may in said provision indicates that the grant of bail is merely permissive and not mandatory on the part of the commissioner. The exercise of the power is wholly discretionary. Neither the Constitution nor Section 69 of the Revised Administrative Code guarantees the right of aliens facing deportation to provisional liberty on bail. As deportation proceedings do not partake of the nature of a criminal action, the constitutional guarantee to bail may not be invoked by aliens in said proceedings. 3. Since deportation proceedings do not constitute criminal actions, and an order of deportation is not a punishment for a crime, the right to bail guaranteed by the constitution may not be invoked by an alien in said proceedings.
who furnishes the bail. The bail may be furnished by the bail applicant himself or by a bondsman. Section 1, Rule 114. Obligation and Right of the Bondsman, Arrest Without a Warrant. 1. The bondsman shall surrender the accused to the court for execution of the final judgment. Section 2D. For the purpose of surrendering the accused, the bondsman may arrest him or, upon written authority endorsed on a certified copy of the undertaking, cause him to be arrested by a police officer or any other person of suitable age and discretion. Section 23. 2. An accused released on bail may be rearrested without the necessity of a warrant if he attempts to depart from the Philippines without permission of the court where the case is pending, Section 23, Rule 114, Rules of Court. 3. The authority of the bondsman to arrest or cause the arrest of the accused springs from the old principle that once the obligation of bail is assumed, the bondsman or surety becomes the jailer of the accused and is subrogated to all the rights and means which the government possesses to make his control over him effective. The applicant for bail must be in custody. 1. If bail is the security for the release of a person under custody, bail cannot be availed of by someone outside the custody of the law. A freeman therefore, is not entitled to bail. 2. The rule considers bail as applicable only to a person in custody of the law and does not cover a person who is in the enjoyment of his physical liberty. A fugitive therefore, may not apply for bail unless he gives himself up first so he may be placed under the custody of the law. Thus, it would be incongruous, to file a petition for bail for someone whose freedom has yet to be curtailed. 3. Custody of the law is required before the court can act on an application for bail, but is not required for the adjudication of other relief sought by the defendant. Hence, an application for admission to bail by one who is at large is premature. A person applying for admission to bail must be in the custody of the law or otherwise deprived of his liberty. A person who has not submitted himself to the jurisdiction of the court has no right to invoke the processes of that court. The judge therefore, should diligently ascertain the whereabouts of the applicant and that he indeed has jurisdiction over the body of the accused before considering the application for bail. As bail is intended to obtain or secure one's provisional liberty, the same cannot be posted before custody over him is acquired by the judicial authorities, either by his lawful arrest or voluntary surrender. It would be incongruous to grant bail to one who is free. The rationale behind this rule is to discourage and prevent the practice where the accused could just send another in his stead to post his bail, without recognizing the jurisdiction of the court by his personal appearance. 4. A person is said to be in custody if he is arrested by virtue of a warrant or even without a warrant pursuant to the rules of court or if he voluntarily submits himself to the jurisdiction of the court as when he surrenders to the proper authorities. A person is deemed to be under the custody of the law either when he has been arrested or has surrendered himself to the jurisdiction of the court. The accused who is confined in a hospital may be deemed to be in the custody of the law if he clearly communicates his submission to the court while confined in a hospital. 5. In Defensor Santiago v. Vasquez, the petitioner who was charged before the San Diego Bayan for a violation of the Anti-Grout and Corrupt Practices Act, filed through counsel what purported to be an urgent tax party motion for acceptance of cash bail bond. Said petitioner was at the time confined in a hospital recuperating from serious physical injuries which she sustained in a major vehicular mishap. Consequently, she expressly sought leave that she be considered as having placed herself under the jurisdiction of the Santa Ganbayan for purposes of the required trial and other proceedings. On the basis of said ex party motion and the peculiar circumstances obtaining in that incident, the Sam began by an authorized petitioner to post a cash bail bond for her provisional liberty without need of her personal appearance in view of her physical incapacity and as a matter of humane consideration. Bail to guarantee appearance of witnesses, bar 1999. 1. While the rule is that bail does not apply to a person who is not in custody of the law, the bail required to secure the appearance of a material witness constitutes an exception to the rule because he may hear to post bail even if he is not under detention. 
bail may thus be required to guarantee the appearance of a material witness other than that of the accused, Section 14, Rule 119. When the court is satisfied, upon proof or oath, that a material witness will not testify when required, the court, may, upon motion of either party, order the witness to post bail and such sum as may be deemed proper. If he refuses to post bail, the court shall commit him to prison until he complies or is legally discharged after his testimony has been taken. 2. Also, if it appears at any time before judgment that a mistake has been made in charging the proper offence, the court shall dismiss the original complaint or information upon the filing of a new one charging the proper offence as long as the accused is not placed in double jeopardy. The court may require the witnesses to give bail for their appearance at the trial. Section 14, Rule 110. Bail for those not yet charged. 1. What entitles a person to bail is his being under the custody of the law. Hence, any person in custody who is not yet charged in court may apply for bail with any court in the province, city, or municipality where he is held. Section 17c, Rule 114. A person deprived of his liberty by virtue of his arrest or voluntary surrender may apply for bail as soon as he is deprived of his liberty, even before a complaint or information is filed against him. 2. The application for bail shall be made with any court in the province, city or municipality where the person arrested is held. In Ruiz v. Belbia, Jr., the person arrested was detained in Comp Graham, Quezon City pending the filing of formal charges in court. Upon inquest, the arrestee executed a waiver of the provisions of Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code in relation to Section 7, Rule 112 of the then applicable 1985 Rules of Criminal Procedure. The inquest prosecutor thus set the hearing of the preliminary investigation. However, a day before the preliminary investigation, the arrestee obtained an order of release signed by the respondent judge who was then detailed as assisting judge of Branch 272, Regional Trial Court of Marikina City. The certificate of detention issued by the plug and play shows that the arrestee was detained at Camp Crame in Quezon City. The court ruled that as correctly pointed out by the office of the court administrator, the application for bail should have been filed before the proper Quezon City Court and not in Marikina City. 3. It is elementary that a municipal trial court judge has no authority to grant bail to an accused arrested outside of his territorial jurisdiction. Effects of Failure to Appear at the Trial 1. The failure of the accused to appear at the trial without justification despite due notice shall be deemed a waiver of his right to be present and the trial may proceed in absentia. 2. The bondsman may arrest the accused for the purpose of surrendering the accused. The bondsman may also cause the accused to be arrested by a police officer or any other person of suitable age and discretion upon written authority endorsed on a certified copy of the undertaking, Section 23. Rule 114. For more audiobook like this, subscribe. Court cannot require arraignment before the grant of bail. 1. In Levitz v. Court of Appeals, the court ruled on the issue of whether an accused must first be arraigned before he may be granted bail. Levitz involved an accused charged with violation of Section 5B Republic Act No. 7610, the Special Protection of Children Against Abuse. Exploitation and Discrimination Act, an offence punishable by reclusion temporal in its medium period to reclusion perpetua. The accused therein assailed the trial court's imposition of the condition that he should first be arraigned before he is allowed to post bail. It was held in Levitz that the grant of bail should not be conditioned upon the prior arraignment of the accused. In cases where bail is authorised, bail should be granted before arraignment, Otherwise the accused will be precluded from filing a motion to quash which is to be done before arraignment. If the information is quashed and the case is dismissed, there would be no need for the arraignment of the accused. To condition the grant of bail on his arraignment would be to place him in a position where he has to choose between, 1, filing a motion to quash and thus delay his release until his motion can be resolved because prior to its resolution, he cannot be arraigned, and, 2, 
foregoing the filing of a motion to quash so that he can be arraigned as once and thereafter be released on bail. These scenarios undermine the accused's constitutional right not to be put on trial except upon a valid complaint or information sufficient to charge him with a crime and his right to bail. 2. In Sir Appeal v. Sanda Gandbayan, the prosecution argued that arraignment is necessary before bail hearings may be commenced, because it is only upon arraignment that the issues are joined. Accordingly, it is only when an accused pleads not guilty may he file a petition for bail and if he pleads guilty to the charge, there would be no more need for him to file said petition. The prosecution further argued that since it is during arraignment that the accused is first informed of the precise charge against him, he must be arraigned prior to the bail hearings to prevent him from later assailing the validity of the bail hearings on the ground that he was not properly informed of the charge against him, especially considering that, under Section 8, Rule 114 of the Revised Rules of Court, evidence presented during such proceedings are considered automatically reproduced at the trial. Likewise, the arraignment of an accused prior to bail hearings diminishes the possibility of an accused's flight from the jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan because trial in absentia may be had only if an accused escape after he has been arraigned. It was likewise argued that the conduct of bail hearings prior to arraignment would extend to an accused the undeserved privilege of being appraised of the prosecution's evidence before he pleads guilty for purposes of penalty reduction. The contention of the accused petitioner that the arraignment of an accused is not a prerequisite to the conduct of hearings on his petition for bail was sustained, it was ruled that a person is allowed to petition for bail as soon as he is deprived of his liberty by virtue of his arrest or voluntary surrender. An accused need not wait for his arraignment before filing a petition for bail. It is not necessary that an accused be first arraigned before the conduct of hearings on his application for bail. Or when bail is a matter of right, an accused may apply for and be granted bail even prior to arraignment. The court stressed that its ruling in Labids also implies that an application for bail in a case involving an offence punishable by reclusion perpetua to death may also be heard even before an accused is arraigned. Further, if the court finds in such case that the accused is entitled to bail because the evidence against him is not strong, he may be granted provisional liberty even prior to arraignment, for in such a situation, bail would be authorized under the circumstances. And fine, the Sam de Ganbayan committed a grave abuse of its discretion amounting to excess of jurisdiction in ordering the arraignment of petitioner before proceeding with the hearing of his petition for bail. The court in Serapio however, clarified that its pronouncements in Lavids should not be taken to mean that the hearing on a petition for bail should at all times proceed arraignment, because the rule is that a person deprived of his liberty by virtue of his arrest or voluntary surrender may apply for bail as soon as he is deprived of his liberty, even before a complaint or information is filed against him. The court cautioned that its pronouncements in Lavids should be understood in the light of the fact that the accused in said case filed a petition for bail as well as a motion to quash the information filed against him. Hence, the ruling that to condition the grant of bail to an accused on his arraignment would be to place him in a position where he has to choose between filing a motion to quash and foregoing the filing of a motion to quash so that he can be arraigned as once and thereafter be released on bail would undermine his constitutional right not to be put on trial except upon a valid complaint or information sufficient to charge him with a crime and his right to bail. Another related issue decided in Serapio was whether or not a motion to quash may be filed during the pendency of a petition for bail, that whether or not the motion and the petition are not inconsistent and may proceed independently of each other. Ruling on the issue, the court finds that no such inconsistency exists between an application of an accused for bail and the filing of a motion to quash. Bail is the security given for the release of a person in the custody of the law, furnished by him or a bondsman, to guarantee his appearance before any court as required under the conditions set forth under the rules of court. Its purpose is to obtain the provisional liberty of a person charged with an offence until his conviction while at the same time securing his appearance at the trial. As stated earlier. A person may apply for bail from the moment that he is deprived of his liberty by virtue of his arrest or voluntary surrender. On the other hand, 
A motion to quash an information is the mode by which an accused assails the validity of a criminal complaint or information filed against him for insufficiency on its face and point of law, or for defects which are apparent in the face of the information. An accused may file a motion to quash the information, as a general rule, before arraignment. These two reliefs have objectives which are not necessarily antithetical to each other. Certainly, the right of an accused to seek provisional liberty when charged with an offense not punishable by death, reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment, or when charged with an offense punishable by such penalties but after due hearing, evidence of his guilt is found not to be strong, does not preclude his right to assail the validity of the information charging him with such offense. It must be conceded. However, that if a motion to quash a criminal complaint or information on the ground that the same does not charge any offence is granted and the case is dismissed and the accused is ordered released, the petition for bail of an accused may become moot and academic. Forms of Bailed, Bar 1999 1. Bail may be given in the following forms. a. Corporate surety b. Property bond c. Cash deposit, or D. Recognizance, Section 1, Rule 114. 2. Corporate surety, this is bail furnished by a corporation. Under the rules of court, any domestic or foreign corporation which is licensed as a surety and authorized to act as such, may provide bail by a bend subscribed jointly by the accused and an officer of the corporation duly authorized by the Board of Directors, Section 10, Rule 114. Act No. 536 enacted on November 25, 1902 prescribes the conditions before corporations could be allowed to act as sureties for bonds and undertakings. 3. Property bond. A property bond is an undertaking constituted as lien on the real property given as security for the amount of the bail. Within 10 days from the approval of the bond. The accused shall cause the annotation on the certificate of title on file with the Registry of Deeds. If the land is unregistered, it is annotated in the registration book on the space provided therefore in the Registry of Deeds of the province or city where the land lies. The registration is likewise made on the corresponding tax declaration in the office of the provincial, city and municipal assessor concerned. Within 10 days from the performance of the above acts, the accused shall submit his compliance to the court. His failure to do so shall be sufficient cause for the cancellation of the property bond, his rearrest and detention, Section 11. The sureties in a property bond must have the following qualifications. A. Each must be a resident owner of real estate within the Philippines. B. Where there is only one surety, his real estate must be worth at least the amount of the undertaking. C. If there are two or more sureties, each may justify in an amount less than that expressed in the undertaking but the aggregate of the justified sums must be equivalent to the whole amount of the bail demanded. In all cases, every surety must be worth the amount specified in his own undertaking over and above all just debts, obligations and properties exempt from execution, Section 12. Every surety is also required to justify by affidavit taken before the judge that he possesses the qualifications of a surety also describing the property and all relevant matters required to be so stated by the rules of court. No bail shall be approved unless the surety is qualified. Section 13. 4. Cash deposit. Bail may also be in the form of a cash deposit. The accused or any person acting in his behalf may deposit in cash with the nearest collector of internal revenue or provincial, city, or municipal treasurer or the clerk of court where the case is pending, the amount of bail fixed by the court or recommended by the prosecutor who investigated or filed the case. The accused shall be discharged from custody upon submission of the certificate of deposit and a written undertaking showing compliance with the requirements of the rules of court. The money deposited shall be considered as bail and applied to the payment of fine and costs while the excess, if any, shall be returned to the accused or to whoever made the deposit. Section 14. The deposit must be made with the persons enumerated in the rule. Irrefragably, only the collector of internal revenue, city or provincial, city or municipal treasurer is authorized to receive bail and cash.
A judge is not one of those authorized to receive a deposit of cash bailed, nor should such cash be kept in the judge's office, much less in his own residence. 5. Recognizance. This is an obligation of record entered into before some court or magistrate duly authorized to take it, with the condition to do some particular act, the most usual condition in criminal cases being the appearance of the accused for trial. A person in custody may be released on recognizance whenever allowed by law or by the rules of court. The release may be either on the recognizance of the accused himself or that of a responsible person. Section 15. 6. Release on recognizance may be ordered by the court in the following cases. a. When the offence charged is for violation of an ordinance, a light felony, or a criminal offence, the imposable penalty of which does not exceed six months imprisonment and or 2,000 pesos fine, under the circumstances provided in RA No. 6036. b. Where a person has been in custody for a period equal to or more than the minimum of the imposable principal penalty, without application of the indeterminate sentence law or any modifying circumstance, in which case, the court may allow his release on his own recognizance, or on a reduced bail, at the discretion of the court. c. Where the accused has applied for probation, pending finality of the judgment but no bail was filed or the accused is incapable of filing one, pd 968, section 7, ant. d. In case of a youthful offender held for physical and mental examination, trial, or appeal, if he is unable to furnish bail and under the circumstances envisaged in PD 603, as amended. e. In summary procedure, when the accused has been arrested for failure to appear when required, his release shall be either on bail or on recognizance by a responsible citizen acceptable to the court. Guidelines in fixing the amount of bailed. Bar 1999. 1. The basic rule in fixing the amount of bail is that excessive bail shall not be required. In fixing bail, the amount should be high enough to assure the presence of the accused when such presence is required but no higher than is reasonably calculated to fulfill this purpose. Another principle to consider is the good of the public as well as the rights of the accused. The inability of the accused to secure bail in a certain amount is not solely to be considered and this fact does not by itself make bail excessive. When an accused has no means to bail himself out, any amount fixed, no matter how small would fall into the category of excessive bail. 2. The judge who issued the warrant or who granted the application for bail shall fix a reasonable amount of bail considering primarily, but not limited to, the following factors. A. Financial ability of the accused to give bail. B. Nature and circumstances of the offense. C. Penalty for the offense charged. D. Character and reputation of the accused. E. Age and health of the accused. F. Weight of the evidence against the accused. G. Probability of the accused appearing at the trial. H. Forfeiture of other bail. I. The fact that the accused was a fugitive from justice when arrested, aunt. J. Pendency of other cases where the accused is on bail. 3. The existence of a high degree of probability that the defendant will abscond confers upon the court no greater discretion than to increase the bond to such an amount as would reasonably tend to assure the presence of the defendant when it is wanted, such amount to be subject, of course, to the provision that excessive bail shall not be required. Duration of the bail. 1. The undertaking under the bail shall be effective upon approval, and unless cancelled, shall remain in force at all stages of the case until promulgation of judgment of the regional trial court, irrespective of whether the case was originally filed in or appealed to at good standing in the community a sworn statement binding himself, pending final decision of his case, to report to the clerk of the court hearing his case periodically every two weeks. The court may, in its discretion and with the consent of the person charged, require further that he be placed under the custody and subject to the authority of a responsible citizen in the community who may be willing to accept the responsibility. In such a case, the affidavit herein mentioned shall include a statement of the person charged that he binds himself to accept the authority of the citizen so appointed by the court. 
the clerk of court shall immediately report the presence of the accused person to the court. Except when his failure to report is for justifiable reasons including circumstances beyond his control to be determined by the court, any violation of this sworn statement shall justify the court to order his immediate arrest unless he files bail in the amount forthwith fixed by the court. When bail is not allowed. Bail is not allowed in the following cases. 1. A person charged with a capital offense, or an offense punishable by reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment, shall be not admitted to bail when evidence of guilt is strong regardless of the stage of the criminal prosecution. 2. Bail shall not be allowed after a judgment of conviction has become final. The rule is that no bail shall be allowed after a judgment of conviction has become final. If before finality of the judgment, the accused applies for probation, he may be allowed temporary liberty under his bail. When no bail was filed or the accused is incapable of filing one, the court may allow his release on recognizance to the custody of a responsible member of the community. 3. Bail shall not be allowed after the accused has commenced to serve sentence. When bail is a matter of right, bar 1999, 2006, 2008. 1. The general rule is that all persons in custody shall be admitted to bail as a matter of right. This rule applies to the following situations. a. Before conviction by the Metropolitan Trial Court, Municipal Trial Court, Municipal Trial Court and Cities, or Municipal Circuit Trial Court. b. After conviction by the courts mentioned in letter a, aunt. c. Before conviction by the Regional Trial Court of an offense not punishable by death, reclusion perpetua, or life imprisonment. 2. When the records show that the accused was charged with violation of Section 15, Article 3 of R.A. No. 6425 which is punishable by prison correctional, following the provisions of the Constitution and the revised rules of criminal procedure, complainant is entitled to bail as a matter of right. Where bail is a matter of right and prior absconding and forfeiture is not accepted from such right, bail must be allowed irrespective of such circumstance. The existence of a high degree of probability that the defendant will abscond confers upon the court no greater discretion than to increase the bond to such an amount as would reasonably tend to assure the presence of the defendant when it is wanted, such amount to be subject, of course, to the other provision that excessive bail shall not be required. The recourse of the judge is to fix a higher amount of bail and not to cancel the same. 3. Bail is not a matter of right to a person charged with a capital offense, or an offense punishable by reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment. He shall not be admitted to bail when evidence of guilt is strong regardless of the stage of the criminal prosecution. Thus, before conviction of the accused by the regional trial court for an offense punishable by death, reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment, bail may or may not be given depending upon the strength of the evidence of guilt. Whether or not the evidence of guilt is strong is a matter to be determined by the court after a hearing to be conducted with notice of the hearing to the prosecutor or a requirement for him to submit his recommendation. The prosecution has the burden of showing that evidence of guilt is strong. 4. The exercise by the trial court of its discretionary power to grant bail to an accused charged with a capital offense thus depends on whether the evidence of guilt is strong. The court should first conduct a hearing, whether summary or otherwise, in the discretion of the court to determine the existence of strong evidence or the lack of it. This hearing is to enable the judge to make an intelligent assessment of the evidence presented and merely to determine the weight of evidence for purposes of bail. In a bail hearing, the court does not sit to try the merits of the case, People v. Plaza. 5. Bail is not a matter of right in cases where the person is charged with a capital offense or an offense punishable by reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment. Remedy when bail is denied. The remedy of the petitioner from the order of the trial court denying a petition for bail is to file a petition for certiorari if the trial court committed a grave abuse of its discretion amounting to excess or lack of jurisdiction in issuing the said order, People v. Gomez. When bail is a matter of discretion, bar 1999, 2006, 2008. 1. 
In Section 4B of Rule 114, recall that bail is a matter of right before conviction by the Regional Trial Court of an offence not punishable by death, reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment. But when the accused has been convicted in the Regional Trial Court of an offence not punishable by death, reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment, the admission to bail becomes discretionary. Since the grant of bail is a matter of discretion, a hearing must be conducted whether or not the prosecution refuses to present evidence and the prosecutor must be notified to require him to submit his recommendation. This notice of hearing applies in all cases whether bail is a matter of right or a matter of discretion. 2. If the grant of bail becomes discretionary when the accused has been convicted in the regional trial court of an offence not punishable by death, reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment, it follows that if the penalty imposed is death, reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment, bail should be denied because this means that the reason for the conviction is that the evidence of guilt against him is strong. Thus. In the early case of People v. Nietzsche, the court clearly declared that if an accused is sentenced to suffer reclusion perpetua, his conviction clearly imports that the evidence of guilt is strong. People v. Nietzsche clearly declares. The clear implication therefore, is that if an accused who is charged with a crime punishable by reclusion perpetua is convicted by the trial court and sentenced to suffer such a penalty, Bail is neither a matter of right on the part of the accused nor of discretion on the part of the court. In such a situation, the court would not have only determined that the evidence of guilt is strong, which would have been sufficient to deny bail even before conviction, it would have likewise ruled that the accused's guilt has been proven beyond reasonable doubt. Bail must not then be granted to the accused during the pendency of his appeal from the judgment of conviction. 3. It is a misconception that when an accused is charged with the crime of murder, he is not entitled to bail at all or that the crime of murder is non-bailable. The grant of bail to an accused charged with an offence that carries with it the penalty of reclusion perpetua is discretionary on the part of the trial court. In other words, the accused is still entitled to bail but no longer as a matter of right. Instead, it is discretionary and calls for a judicial determination that the evidence of guilt is not strong in order to grant bail. The prosecution is accorded ample opportunity to present evidence because by the very nature of deciding applications for bail, it is on the basis of such evidence that judicial discretion is weighed in determining whether the guilt of the accused is strong. Where application for bail is to be filed when bail is a matter of discretion and after conviction by the regional trial court. 1. The application for bail may be filed and acted upon by the trial court even if a notice of appeal has already been filed provided that the trial court has not yet transmitted the original record to the appellate court. Corollarily, if the original record has already been transmitted to the appellate court, then the application shall be filed with the said appellate court. 2. The rule allowing the filing of the application for bail in the trial court prior to the transmission of the original record is consistent with Section 6 of Rule 120. The second sentence of the second paragraph of said section provides that, the court promulgating the judgment shall have authority to accept the notice of appeal and to approve the bail bond pending appeal. 3. If the decision of the RTC convicting the accused changed the nature of the offence from non-bailable to bailable, the application for bail can only be filed with and resolved by the appellate court. Section 6 of Rule 120 has a similar provision thus, if the decision of the trial court convicting the accused changed the nature of the offence from non-bailable to bailable, the application for bail can only be filed and resolved by the appellate court. 4. If the application for bail is granted, the accused may be allowed to continue on provisional liberty during the pendency of the appeal under the same bail. This rule is however, subject to the consent of the bondsman, Section 5, Rule 114, Rules of Court. The consent of the bondsman shall be required to have provisional liberty under the same bail because of the rule in Section 2A of Rule 114, that the undertaking shall be effective until promulgation of judgment of the regional trial court. When application for bail after conviction by the RTC shall be denied. 1. If the penalty imposed is death, reclusion perpetual or life imprisonment, 
Bail should be denied since the conviction indicates strong evidence of guilt based on proof beyond reasonable doubt. 2. Even if the penalty imposed by the trial court is not any of the above but merely imprisonment exceeding six years, the accused shall be denied bail, or his bail already allowed shall be cancelled, if the prosecution shows the following or other similar circumstances. a. That the accused is a recidivist or a quasi-recidivist a habitual delinquent or has committed the crime aggravated by the circumstance of reiteration. b. That the accused has previously escaped from legal confinement, evaded sentence, or violated the conditions of his bail without valid justification. c. That the accused committed the offense while under probation, parole or conditional pardon. d. That the circumstances of his case indicate the probability of flight if released on bail, or e that there is undue risk that he may commit another crime during the pendency of the appeal. The court is not authorized to deny or cancel the bail as party. The rule requires notice to the accused. The resolution of the regional trial court denying or cancelling the bail may be reviewed by the appellate court modi proprio or on motion of any party after notice to the adverse party in either case. Bail pending appeal where penalty imposed exceeds six years. 1. In an application for bail pending appeal by an appellant sentenced by the trial court to a penalty of imprisonment for more than six years, that discretionary nature of the grant of bail pending appeal does not mean that bail should automatically be granted absent any of the circumstances mentioned in the third paragraph of Section 5, Rule 114 of the Rules of Court, Pose A. Antonio Levist v. Court of Appeals. 2. The third paragraph of Section 5, Rule 114 applies to two scenarios where the penalty imposed on the appellant applying for bail is imprisonment exceeding six years. The first scenario deals with circumstances enumerated in the said paragraph not being present. The second scenario contemplates the existence of at least one of the said circumstances. In this first situation, bail is a matter of sound judicial discretion. This means that, if none of the circumstances mentioned in the third paragraph of Section 5, Rule 114 is present, the appellate court has the discretion to grant or deny bail. An application for bail pending appeal may be denied even if the bail negating circumstances in the third paragraph of Section 5, Rule 114 are absent. On the other hand, in the second situation, the appellate court exercises a more stringent discretion. That is, to carefully ascertain whether any of the enumerated circumstances in fact exists. If it so determines, it has no other option except to deny or revoke bail pending appeal. Thus, a finding that none of the said circumstances is present will not automatically result in the grant of bail. Such finding will simply authorize the court to use the less stringent sound discretion approach. 3. The appellant has no right to be freed on bail pending his appeal from the tried court's judgment where his conviction carries a penalty of imprisonment exceeding six years and there is a justification for the cancellation of his bail pursuant to the third paragraph of Section 5, B, D, and E, of Rule 114. The inexcusable non-appearance in court of the appellant not only violated the condition of his bail that he shall appear before the court whenever required by the court or the rules. It also showed the probability that he might flee or commit another crime while released on bail. For more audiobook like this, subscribe. Hearing of application for bail and offenses punishable by death, reclusion perpetua, or life imprisonment, burden of proof and bail application. 1. A hearing of the application for bail is to be conducted when a person is in custody for the commission of an offense punishable by death, reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment. In the hearing, the prosecution has the burden of showing that the evidence of guilt is strong. Bail in this type of offense is not a matter of right. When the granting of bail is not a matter of right or is merely discretionary, as when the offense is punishable by reclusion perpetua, a hearing, whether summary or otherwise in the discretion of the court, should first be conducted to determine the existence of strong evidence or lack of it against the accused to enable the judge to make an intelligent assessment of the evidence presented by the parties. 2. 
A summary hearing is defined as such brief and speedy method of receiving and considering the evidence of guilt as is practicable and consistent with the purpose of hearing which is merely to determine the weight of evidence for the purposes of bail. On such hearing, the court does not sit to try their merits or to enter into any nice inquiry as to the weight that ought to be allowed to the evidence for or against the accused, nor will it speculate on the outcome of the trial or on what further evidence may be therein offered and admitted. The course of inquiry may be left to the discretion of the court which may confine itself to receiving such evidence as has reference to substantial matters, avoiding unnecessary examination and cross-examination. Reliance by the judge on the alleged voluminous records of the case does not suffice because the judge is mandated to conduct a hearing on the petition for bail of the accused since he knew that the crime charged is one that carries a penalty of reclusion perpetua, and in that hearing, the prosecution is entitled to present its evidence. It is worth stressing that the prosecution is equally entitled to due process. Another compelling reason why a hearing of a petition for bail is necessary is to determine the amount of bail based on the guidelines set forth in Section 6, now Section 9, Rule 114 of the Rules of Court. Without the required hearing, the bail which may be granted to the accused would be arbitrary and without basis. 3. A hearing is plainly indispensable before a judge can determine whether the evidence for the prosecution is strong. Jurisprudence is replete with decisions compelling judges to conduct the required hearings in bail applications, in which the accused stands charged with a capital offense. The absence of objection from the prosecution is never basis for the grant of bail in such cases. The judge has no right to presume that the prosecutor knows what he is doing on account of familiarity with the case because it has the effect of ceding to the prosecutor the duty of exercising judicial discretion to determine whether the guilt of the accused is strong. The duty to exercise discretion on the matter is not reposed upon the prosecutor because judicial discretion is the domain of the judge. 4. The bail hearing is mandatory in order to give the prosecution reasonable opportunity to oppose the application by proving that the evidence of guilt is strong. 5. In Marchiso v. Santa Romana Cruz, the petitioner was charged with parasite, an offense which is punishable with reclusion perpetua. He argued before the Court of Appeals that he was entitled to bail because the evidence of his guilt was not strong as indicated by the prosecutor's conformity to his motion for bail. This conformity, argued the petitioner, was tantamount to a finding that the prosecution evidence against him was not strong. The Court of Appeals disagreed because the records show that no hearing had been conducted on the application for bail. The appellate court found that only ten minutes had elapsed between the filing of the motion by the accused and the order granting bail. This period, according to the appellate court was not sufficient for the trial court to receive and evaluate any evidence. The Supreme Court agreed with the Court of Appeals and stressed the duty of a judge to determine whether the evidence of guilt was strong. The Supreme Court held. When the grant of bail is discretionary, the prosecution has the burden of showing that the evidence of guilt against the accused is strong. However, the determination of whether or not the evidence of guilt is strong, being a matter of judicial discretion, remains with the judge. This discretion by the very nature of things, may rightly be exercised only after the evidence is submitted to the court at the hearing. Since the discretion is directed to the weight of the evidence and since evidence cannot properly be weighed if not duly exhibited or produced before the court, it is obvious that a proper exercise of judicial discretion requires that the evidence of guilt be submitted to the court, the petitioner having the right of cross-examination and to introduce his own evidence in rebuttal. Consequently, in the application for bail of a person charged with a capital offense punishable by death, reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment, a hearing, whether summary or otherwise in the discretion of the court, must actually be conducted to determine whether or not the evidence of guilt against the accused is strong. A summary hearing means such brief and speedy method of receiving and considering the evidence of guilt as is practicable and consistent with the purpose of hearing which is merely to determine the weight of evidence for the purposes of bail. On such hearing, the court does not sit to try their merits or to enter into any nice inquiry as to the weight that ought to be allowed to the evidence for or against the accused, 
nor will it speculate on the outcome of the trial or on what further evidence may be therein offered and admitted. The course of inquiry may be left to the discretion of the court which may confine itself to receiving such evidence as has reference to substantial matters, avoiding unnecessary thoroughness in the examination and cross-examination. If a party is denied the opportunity to be heard, there would be a violation of procedural due process. 6. It is a mandatory duty to conduct a hearing despite the prosecution's refusal to adduce evidence in opposition to the application to grant and fix bail or when the prosecution chooses to just file a comment. The fact that the prosecutor interposed no objection to the application for bail by the accused does not relieve the judge of the duty to set the motion for bail for hearing. Duties of the trial judge in a petition for bail and offenses punishable by reclusion perpetua, life imprisonment or death. 1. Summarizing earlier jurisprudence, Narciso v. Santa Romana Cruz enumerated the following duties of the trial judge in a petition for bail and offenses punishable by death, reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment. a. Notify the prosecutor of the hearing of the application for bail or require him to submit his recommendation. b. Conduct a hearing of the application for bail regardless of whether or not the prosecution refuses to present evidence to show that the guilt of the accused is strong for the purpose of enabling the court to exercise its sound discretion. c. Decide whether the evidence of guilt of the accused is strong based on the summary of evidence of the prosecution. d. If the guilt of the accused is not strong, discharge the accused upon the approval of the bail bond. Otherwise, the petitions should be denied. The above enumerated procedure should now leave no room for doubt as to the duties of the trial judge in cases of bail applications. So basic and fundamental is it to conduct a hearing in connection with the grant of bail and the proper cases that it would amount to judicial apostasy for any member of the judiciary to disclaim knowledge or awareness thereof. Additionally, the court's grant or refusal of bail must contain a summary of the evidence for the prosecution on the basis of which should be formulated the judge's own conclusion on whether such evidence is strong enough to indicate the guilt of the accused. The summary thereof is considered an aspect of procedural due process for both the prosecution and the defense, its absence will invalidate the grant or the denial of the application for bail. 2. Even if the capital offense charged is bailable owing to the weakness of the evidence of guilt. The right to bail may justifiably still be denied if the probability of escape is great. 3. A grant of bail does not prevent the trier of facts from making a final assessment of the evidence after full trial on the merits. Evidence and bail hearing are automatically reproduced at the trial. The evidence presented during the bail hearing shall be considered automatically reproduced at the trial. However, any witness during the bail hearing may, upon motion of either party, be recalled by the court for additional examination except if such witness is dead, outside the Philippines, or otherwise unable to testify, Section 8, Rule 114. Capital Offenses 1. A capital offense is an offense which, under the law existing at the time of its commission and of the application for admission to bail, may be punished with death. Section 6, Rule 114. 2. It is clear from the rules of court that the capital nature of an offense is determined by the penalty prescribed by law and not the penalty to be actually imposed. 3. The imposition of the death penalty is now prohibited by RA 9346 enacted into law on June 24, 2006. Section 2 provides that in lieu of the death penalty, the following shall be imposed. a. The penalty of reclusion perpetua, when the law violated makes use of the nomenclature of the penalties of the RPC, or b. The penalty of life imprisonment, when the law violated does not make use of the nomenclature of the penalties of the RPC. Effect of Republic Act No. 9346 on the graduation of penalties. In People v. Bond, the court was confronted by the question of whether or not the enactment of RA No. 9346 resulted in the statutory interdiction of the death penalty. Giving rise to the issue was the sentence of reclusion temporal imposed on the accused appellant by the Court of Appeals for the two counts of attempted qualified rape committed against a minor by relative mentioned in the law. 
The sentence was prescribed by the appellate court prior to the enactment of R.A. No. 9346 which ended the imposition of the death penalty in the Philippines. The concern of the accused appellant is whether his penalty for attempted qualified rape, which under the penal law should be two degrees lower than that of consummated qualified rape, should be computed from death or reclusion perpetua. This is because Section 2 of R.A. No. 9346 provides that instead of the death penalty, the penalty of reclusion perpetua or life imprisonment when appropriate shall be imposed. The court found no doubt as to the validity of this sentence at the time it was meted prior to the enactment of R.A. No. 9346. The prescribed penalty for the consummated rape of a victim duly proven to have been under 18 years of age and to have been raped by her uncle, is death under Article 266B of the Revised Penal Code. The determination of the penalty two degrees lower than the death penalty entails the application of Articles 61 and 71 of the Revised Penal Code. Following the scale prescribed in Article 71, the penalty two degrees lower than death is reclusion temporal, which was the maximum penalty imposed by the Court of Appeals on appellant for attempted rape. Reclusion temporal is a penalty comprised of three divisible periods, a minimum, a medium and a maximum. The critical question according to the court is whether R.A. No. 9346 intended to delete the word death as expressly provided for in the graduated scale of penalties under Article 71. The court ruled in the affirmative and found R.A. No. 9346 to unequivocally bar the application of the death penalty, as well as to expressly repeal all such statutory provisions requiring the application of the death penalty. Such effect explained the court, necessarily extends to its relevance to the graduated scale of penalties under Article 71. Hence, the court added, that it cannot find basis to conclude that R.A. No. 9346 intended to retain the operative effects of the death penalty in the graduation of the other penalties in our penal laws. People v. Bond However, stressed that the debarring of the death penalty through R.A. No. 9346 did not correspondingly declassify those crimes previously catalogued as heinous. The amendatory effects of R.A. No. 9346 extend only to the application of the death penalty but not to the definition or classification of crimes. True, the penalties for heinous crimes have been downgraded under the aegis of the new law. Still, what remains extant is the recognition by law that such crimes, by their abhorrent nature, constitute a special category by themselves. Accordingly, R.A. No. 9346 does not serve as basis for the reduction of civil indemnity and other damages that adhere to heinous crimes. Having pronounced and determined the statutory disallowance of the death penalty through R.A. No. 9346 and the corresponding modification of penalties other than death through that statute, the penalty of death, as utilized in Article 71 of the Revised Penal Code, shall no longer form part of the equation in the graduation of penalties. Hence, in the case of accused appellant, the determination of his penalty for attempted rape shall be reckoned not from two degrees lower than death, but two degrees lower than reclusion perpetua. Hence, the maximum term of his penalty shall no longer be reclusion temporal, as ruled by the Court of Appeals, but instead, prison mayor. Where application or petition for bail may be filed, bar 2002. For more audiobook like this, subscribe. 1. As a general rule, the application for bail may be filed with the court where the case is pending. If the judge thereof is absent or unavailable, then the application may be filed with any regional trial court judge, metropolitan trial court judge, municipal trial court judge, or municipal circuit trial court judge in the province, city, or municipality, where there is no showing that the judge of the court where the criminal case is pending is unavailable. Another judge who entertains a bail application despite knowledge of the pendency of the case in another court is clearly in error. Judges who approve applications for bail of accused whose cases are pending in other courts are guilty of gross ignorance of the law. 2. Where the accused is arrested in a province, city, 
or municipality other than where the case is pending, the application for bail may also be filed with any regional trial court of said place. If no judge thereof is available, then with any metropolitan trial court judge, municipal trial court judge or municipal circuit trial court judge in the said place. When bail is filed with the court other than where the case is pending, the judge who accepted the bail shall forward it, together with the order of release and other supporting papers, to the court where the case is pending, which may, for good reasons, require a different one to be filed. The failure of a judge who granted the bail to transmit the order of release and other supporting papers to the court where the case is pending constitutes violation of the rules. 3. Where the grant of bail is a matter of discretion, or the accused seeks to be released on recognizance, the application may only be filed in the court where the case is pending, on trial, or appeal. 4. When a person is in custody but not yet charged, he may apply for bail with any court in the province, city or municipality where he is held. In Ruiz v. Beldia, Jr., the certificate of detention of the person lawfully arrested without a warrant issued by the plug-and-play shows that he was detained at Camp Crame in Quezon City. The application for bail should have been filed before the proper Quezon City Court and not in Marikina City. Increase or Reduction of Bail 1. Even after the accused is admitted to bail, the amount of bail may either be increased or reduced by the court upon good cause. 2. The increased amount must be given within a reasonable period if the accused wants to avoid being taken into custody. The rule is clear, when increased, the accused may be committed to custody if he does not give bail and the increased amount within a reasonable period. Bail for accused originally released without bail. If upon the filing of the complaint or information the accused is released without bail, he may later be required to give bail in the amount fixed by the court whenever at any subsequent stage of the proceedings a strong showing of guilt appears to the court. If he does not give bail he may be committed into custody. Forfeiture of Bail 1. One of the conditions of the bail is for the accused to appear before the proper court whenever required. When his presence is required, his bondsman shall be notified to produce him before the court on a given date and time. 2. If he fails to appear in person as required, his bail shall be declared forfeited. The bondsman shall be given 30 days within which to produce their principal and to show cause why no judgment should be rendered against them for the amount of the bail. The bondsman must, within the period, a. Produce the body of their principal or give the reasons for his non-production, aunt. b. Explain why the accused did not appear before the court when first required to do so. Failing in these two requirements, a judgment shall be rendered against the bondsman, jointly and severally, for the amount of the bailed, section 21. If the bondsman moved for the mitigation of their liability, the court is required not to reduce or otherwise mitigate the liability of the bondsman unless the accused has been surrendered or is acquitted. 3. Judgment against the bondsman cannot be entered unless such judgment is preceded by an order of forfeiture and an opportunity given to the bondsman to produce the accused or to adduce satisfactory reason for their inability to do so. An order of forfeiture is interlocutory and merely requires the bondsman to show cause why judgment should not be rendered against them for the amount of the bond. The order is different from the judgment on the bond which is issued if the accused was not produced within the 30-day period. Cancellation of the Bailed, Remedy 1. Cancellation by application of the bondsman, bail may be cancelled upon application of the bondsman with due notice to the prosecutor, a. upon surrender of the accused, or, b. proof of his death. 2. Automatic Cancellation the bail may also be deemed automatically cancelled upon a. acquittal of the accused, b. dismissal of the case, or c. execution of the judgment of conviction. 3. Section 5 of Rule 114 allows the cancellation of bail where the penalty imposed by the trial court is imprisonment exceeding 6, 6 years if any of the grounds in the said section is present as when the circumstances indicate the probability of flight. The same section authorizes the appellate court to monta proprio or on motion of any party review the resolution of the regional trial court after notice to the adverse party in either case. 
4. It was held in Kua versus Court of Appeals, that from the last paragraph of the above provision, the appropriate remedy against the trial court's order cancelling the bail is by filing with the Court of Appeals a motion to review the said order in the same regular appeal proceedings which the appellant himself initiated, such motion being an incident to his appeal. The filing of a separate petition via a special civil action for certiorari before the appellate court is proscribed and contravenes the rule against multiplicity of suits and constitutes forum shopping. Application for or admission to bail not a bar to objections on illegal arrest, lack of or irregular preliminary investigation. 1. The application or admission of the accused to bail shall not bar him from challenging both the validity of his arrest or the legality of the warrant issued therefore, provided that he raises them before entering his plea. It shall not likewise bar the accused from assailing the regularity or questioning the absence of a preliminary investigation of the charge against him provided the same is raised before he enters his plea. The court shall resolve the matter as early as practicable but not later than the start of the trial of the case. 2. Section 26 of Rule 114 is a new rule intended to modify previous rulings that an application for bail or the admission to bail by the accused shall be considered as a waiver of his right to assail the warrant issued for his arrest on the legalities or irregularities thereon. The new rule is curative in nature because precisely it was designed to curb evils in procedural rules. Procedural rules as a general rule law operate retroactively even without express provisions to actions yet undetermined at the time of their effectivity. 3. The former ruling that the posting of bail constitutes a waiver of any irregularity in the issuance of a warrant of arrest, has already been superseded by Section 26, Rule 114 of the Revised Rules of Criminal Procedure. The principle that the accused is precluded from questioning the legality of the arrest after arraignment is true only if he voluntarily enters his plea and participates during trial, without previously invoking his objections thereto. For more audiobook like this, subscribe.